3000. What is doing? My name's Maloney. This is the 3000 Podcast. I'm joined today by a doc- documentarian, a media person. I don't even know how to describe... You can say journalist. Journalist. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like there's a bit of a difference there. For sure. A journalist and a, uh, a media person. I think, yeah. I don't know, man. How would you describe yourself? Anyway, it's Scobie from What's Doing Media. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I describe myself, yeah, I think foremost a journalist um, and then a filmmaker who, you know, does short form content, a few uh, longer documentary style stuff um, and, you know, stuff I'm working on at the moment is definitely a lot more long form. So, yeah, and just, I don't know, just trying to discover what's going on out there, you know, <laughs> just, what's doing, that's quite it. literally. Just see what's doing. Yeah. Um, so for people that aren't familiar with what's doing media how would you break it down in like a bit of an elevator pitch for them i've been doing this for like three years it's kind of changed a lot initially i kind of wanted it to be a more broad sort of um uh yeah like media outlet that kind of did a lot of different types of journalism and i think more of a platform yeah more of a platform and it's kind of more so morphed into just like a portfolio of my own work mm-hmm. um and yeah i guess it it a lot of the stuff is political fringe stuff, so a lot of uh, focus on radicalism and extremism. On both sides. Um, on both sides of the spectrum, yeah. Um, and I do a lot of uh, stuff on police accountability as well. Um, I've worked in that field uh, before, so it's, it comes naturally. And I also work as a youth worker so I'm in, uh, for local government and also uh, in youth justice roles, so um, I do a lot of focus on youth justice issues as well, uh, youth subcultures, and stuff like that. Yeah. For sure. And I guess working with the youth, when you see this stuff that's impacting the people of Melbourne or Australia, you can sort of look at it from a different perspective. Like, I'm seeing how this is affecting kids right now. Oh, 100%. And it means, makes a difference, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially when I'm looking into, like, disinformation stuff, um, uh, online propaganda, when I'm working with young people that are parroting stuff that they, re- that they listen to on the, on the internet... Um, that I would consider quite harmful, um, especially in the disinformation world. Um, yeah, I'd see that, like, yeah, case in point, like it'll just be right in front of me and I'll be like, damn, this is a 13-year-old kid saying stuff that I would consider quite harmful, yeah. you know? And they don't understand the gravity of it? They don't understand, yeah, they don't understand the gravity or they don't understand the context. Um, and often they put a lot of trust into uh, people that they see on the internet um, mm. that are, yeah, often... Yeah, pushing this, this, these sort of harmful narr- narratives. Yeah, and that is the sort of scary thing, man. Like there's people out there with probably less, you know, audiovisual equipment than I've got in front of me here that have a huge platform that people just believe whatever they fucking say. Oh, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> that's scary. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is the landscape. Man, that's it. All right, well, we'll get into all that stuff because this is going to be super interesting, but let's sort of talk about your personal journey and how you got to doing what's doing media. Were you studying, studying journalism? Were you just getting out there and, mm. and, and uh, having a go? How did it happen, man? Good question. Um, I did, I sort of didn't study journalism. I did one journalism class, uh, sort of elective at university and it was one of the best things I, I did at uni. Um, I studied international studies, but um, yeah, th- I just remember being in this class and it was full of like young journos and they were really good at being journalists. Like they could write, they could do piece to cameras, they could, um, yeah, they could just, they could be the journal. They had no idea what they were talking about. No shade to them. Great people. They had no, like these kids, they knew nothing about what they the were talking about. Came, yeah. They knew exactly how to, and they were being trained to be um, really good, like mainstream media reporters. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, no shade to those people. That's, that's an important job, but that's not the journalism that I ever wanted to pursue. Mm-hmm. Um, I always wanted to pursue journalism that I know about, that I have lived experience in um, and that, yeah, that I can actually bring life to stories, not just narrate someone else's story. For um, sure. It's, yeah, so I, it, it seems like they were just ticking the boxes and they didn't, they lacked the substance of what you kind of needed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you wanted to bring the substance. Absolutely. And so, yeah, then I, got, I suppose I was kind of dabbling in different sort of projects um, that I n- never really felt confident releasing for a few years. And then when... COVID came around and there was a lot of, uh, you know, and, and the lockdowns and everything that 
we as Melbournians went through during that um, period of time, um, I found a niche, I suppose, that I could lock in on, which was the freedom protesters who I um, understood uh, – how, how do I frame this? I – I understood where they came from in terms of their political organisation. So I wasn't necessarily supportive of their ideology or their motives, um, but I understood where they organised from and that was from these um, existing far-right groups um, that had been um, sort of, yeah, existing within Melbourne but keeping it quite low-key or focusing much more on um, uh, race uh, politics and... um, issues like that and now they just had this much broader platform um, to organise on which was these uh, anti-lockdown protests and not to say that everyone involved in the anti-lockdown protests was far right um, but that just that the people that were organising it were from these established far right groups that I'd already been studying and a few other people had already been studying for years. So we found that really interesting. Yeah. So we, so the, the, the impact on Melbourne wasn't necessarily what brought you into it. It was more the political views and then that kind of combined with the impact on the city of Melbourne. Yeah, because I suppose I actually started um, reporting on this in the early days when we'd only been in two or three weeks of lockdown. Yep. And so lockdown at that time had, you know, broad public support um, and uh, people understood why we were doing it in order mm. to, you know, b- protect lives and stuff like that. But there was this really fringe, small minority of, of people who were uh, protesting and bringing in all these conspiracies that had kind of carried on from, um, you know, earlier years about 5G and, and um, yeah, I suppose early things about vaccinations and stuff like that. Because um, there was, I think, sorry to cut you off. Yeah. But there definitely was an anti-vaccination mentality for people out there before any COVID shit happened. No doubt. So as soon as that comes in, those people, instant validation we told you this was always going to happen. They were going to, some big event was going to mean that we were all going to have to do something that we didn't want to do. The lockdown is the start. Then the snowball effect happens. These right wing people then have an easy platform to recruit more people because they're like, we told you so. Exactly. Yeah. You've hit the nail on the head. And and these organizations took that opportunity and, sure. and they absolutely thrived in that yeah. context. Um, they did really well. Um, and, I found it really fascinating and mm. so uh, I ended up going down to many of these protests and interviewing people um, and I suppose what I found was, yeah, I found a lot of really lovely concerned people that were... In it for the right reason? Perhaps they were in it for their own right reason because they genuinely believed... Um, and they were parroting disinformation that they read on the internet, they genuinely believed that there was some sort of nefarious uh, regime in the world that was purposefully trying to kill uh, and depopulate like millions of people across the world through vaccinations or through lockdowns or whatever. Um, and it was really fascinating to me because I was like, look, I, I totally understand the disaffection towards the lockdown. It was miserable two years Mm -hmm. uh but i just don't understand how you've suddenly come to the conclusion that all these conspiracy theories that you've read on the internet are the answer yeah uh and that's what i found really fascinating for sure it's it's all it's a bit of a perfect storm though because people can't do things whether or not they're abiding by the lockdown laws everyone's spending all their time on the internet because realistically you, you you're not afforded many other things that you can do and then the rabbit hole starts to to sort of happen and i think anger plays a part and people just have to frustrate you know they're frustrated and they want to get it out and it all sort of boils over to what we kind of saw yeah definitely and what we saw was really crazy scenes For sure. in melbourne you i think i've said this to some friends and stuff when we talk about this sort of situation very rare, and you you go to a lot of protests, that you would see people that would be deemed to be far right and far left all sort of on the same page. You'll have people that may have been so anti-left and then you've got people who are known as the blue hair, whatever they, you know, mm-hmm. dreadlocks people, sure. all going for the same sort of anti... When would you ever see that again? Yeah, I know. It was, it was, it was really interesting. I think... Um... 
I suppose, yeah, the hippie crowd and the well-being crowd, they've never truly been part of what we would consider the established left um, because they always, yeah, their their views were a bit too esoteric and a bit too eccentric um, and deeply individualistic because it was all about their personal well-being and their personal spirituality as opposed to, uh, you know, broader leftist um, politics of like workers' rights and, and, and collectivism and stuff like that. Right, so I wasn't surprised to see them involved. Mm. Um, were you surprised to see them marching side by side with people that were sort of deemed to be far right? I think that they had complete cognitive dissonance to it because I would ask them. I would ask them to their face. I'd be like, "I like over there. If you can go see, there is a group of neo Nazis," and they'd be like, "Oh, well, you know, like it's just." Amazing that we can just bring everyone out so put a from, from all from all <laughs> sides of, of the of the spectrum to come out here and uh, you know go against Dan Andrews in lockdown. And I'd be like, "Well, wow, that's an interesting way of putting it." I suppose, <laughs> I suppose yeah. you know, if you want to be like toxically positive about it, then that's fine. Um, but yeah, it was it was it was a really interesting time, and and I'm glad I went because I'm glad. Like personally, I don't like seeing people that I disagree with in, I don't like dehumanising people that I disagree with. Um, and that's, you know, a big problem on both sides of the political spectrum. Um, I like to approach uh, people with empathy and I will want to understand why they've, you know, wh- sure. why they've, they've been in, involved in something like this. Or what, what, what makes them believe in such well, conspiracy yeah, theories? For sure. And I think with at that time, and as you've probably found out, your position on the whole situation divided families, essentially. So some of these people might have been ostracised from their immediate family. They go down there and they can all of a sudden look at someone, yeah, brother, we're on the fucking same team. And they and they get that camaraderie yeah. and feeling of fucking being, uh, you know, in it together with somebody. Yeah, definitely. I met so many people that literally had lost family members, um, mums that had been ostracised from their children, uh and the only community that they had was yeah. on the internet. Jobs. Yeah, people lost their uh, careers. People lost uh, their Facebook accounts and you know their mainstream social media accounts. So they moved into you know darker social media worlds where their opinions were kind of mirrored and 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 validated, and it just made their extremism become more and more. Yeah challenging and that is the downside to social media algorithms is you find yourself in an echo chamber pretty quickly exactly yeah yeah and that's what happened a lot and then i'd see people that i knew on facebook sharing stuff that could be deemed to be reasonably extremist when you're like where the fuck did that come from i think we all experience like someone in our lives or perhaps lots of people in our lives really yeah fall fall into that rabbit hole during covid and it was really concerning um, for a lot of us, I suppose. Yeah. And for a lot of conspiracy theorists, it gives them a point of validation. We knew this was coming. Then they start to think, well, maybe some of these other things that we were looking into aren't that far-fetched. Yeah. And that's when things really, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that people believe it, man. I know. Yeah, it's sad. Yeah. Oh, look, each to their own and we don't really know what's going on and I'm sure there is lots happening, you know, in the world that we're not privy to. Whether or not the Premier of Victoria has a grand plan to fucking shut down the country one state at a time, I don't think that was really where it's at, but people believe that, you know. And people were scared. People were um, dealing with significant upheaval in their life and they needed answers and a lot of people do not have, like, a grounded... Uh, political foundation and understanding to work off. So they just are very easy to manipulate on the internet. For sure. And man, I'll be totally honest with you. I'm not somebody that really gives a fuck about politics. I don't vote. That's my sort of, because I just think it's shit. Sure. And I didn't know the difference between Labor and Liberal until this stuff happens and my business starts getting affected. It affects our day-to-day lives. And I start to pay attention because basically we were forced to. All of a sudden, everybody like myself that is not... <laughs> Uh, shouldn't really have too much of a say on politics, all of a sudden has an opinion. And it's fucking, it's a bizarre spot to be in all yeah. of a sudden. It's crazy. I I think even now, you know, with everything that's happening um, in Gaza, 
there's a lot of discourse around how uh, it's a privilege to be apolitical. Um, and I understand that. I understand, you know, where the argument's coming from, that it is a privilege to be apolitical and people should, you know, uh, educate themselves and, and be more informed and, and, and use their voice more. But I'm also sceptical that more people, a lot of people do not have a strong political understanding of how the world works and when they and they when they initially read something they'll just immediately regurgitate it without properly understanding what what they're saying and they're very susceptible to to um, propaganda and misinformation on the internet and perhaps that propaganda and misinformation is coming from the left perhaps it's coming from the right um or maybe it's just someone who's looking for fucking views yeah yeah you exactly. Know? Like I've looked yeah, at exactly. stuff that people have shared that have certain views on my, you know, social media following and I'll see it pop up in a story. You know, you get 15 seconds or whatever. I'm like, all right, I want to see where this is going. I'll click it. I'll look. And when you dive into it, it can sometimes be something that's a parody and they've just seen the first 15 seconds and shared it and all of a sudden they just think, well, yeah, well, that's exactly how I feel. You know, they're not. Do there's a lot of shit on the internet. Yeah. People just take it for face value. Yeah. I know. I, 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 and, you know, as a work, youth worker, I often think we need uh, better media literacy education for young people mm. so that they can discern what on the internet is someone purposefully pushing an opinion uh, to benefit whether or not they're trying to get views or whether or not they're trying to push a political ideology um, and what's actually just factual information that's not intended to be biased. But the, I, does that exist, though? Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, everyone has yeah, an opinion. I know. It's yeah. difficult. It's yeah. really difficult. Yeah. I don't know. And, I, and that's where a media literacy education would be really challenging in order to make sure that it doesn't have a bias. Mm. So in those early days of 2021, when the... Is it 2020? 20, whenever the, the... Yeah, it was kicking off. Um, it's just with the lockdowns. And then the vaccination thing happens and it sort of goes up another notch, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, then a lot of people that perhaps never were never involved in anything political mm. before uh, were suddenly on the streets protesting and it was insanity. I mean, we remember that one week in uh, Melbourne where there was protests every day and they were being uh, violently repressed by uh, the government or by the Victoria Police. They were using rubber bullets and tear gas, things we'd never seen in Australia before. Yeah, tanks down Bourke Street. in modern Street. Australia before. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, that stuff is referenced on global news and podcasts. Like, look at the state of Melbourne, Australia. This is what's happening. And it's fuck. Like, I would watch that shit online and think, I can't believe that's happening where we'd catch the tram, where we would skateboard down the street. It was a fucking spin out. It was truly insane. And... It was really concerning for me because, you know, even though I didn't necessarily agree with the ideologies of the people that were protesting, it was absolutely outrageous that Victoria Police would repress a uh, protest in that fashion so violently. Um, I was super... I, I, to be honest, for me at that point, the ideology of the protesters didn't matter. I was like, Victoria Police are completely out of line uh, with expectations in Australia on, on how we uh, uh, deal with protesters. Yeah. It was outrageous. And did you get a chance to talk to any of the cops and stuff when you were there? Not in those extreme times, but did it, what kind of, what were your dealings like with them? I don't, I didn't talk to any specifically, but I remember uh, specific videos uh, surfacing. I remember one uh, port police, a public order response team police officer talking to a young kid um, and being really frank about how he actually agreed with the protesters, how he didn't want to um, be, you know, that he didn't want to be in lockdown and then he wanted to to live a normal life as well and that he hated Dan Andrews' decision, but he was still shooting them with rubber bullets. And the kid was like, well, why are you still shooting us? And he goes, this is the only job I have. This is the only thing I'm skilled for, mate. And it was like, this, this, is, this is, you know, obviously policing at its core. There is no... Uh, morality yeah. when it comes to decision making it's just purely what your superior says goes and For you sure. have to do it and what we saw is literally uh, protesters being shot well, yeah there there was a, a, a few or I, I know of some uh, cops that refused to get vaccinated and stepped down altogether so there were some people that sort of 
put their money where their mouth is, I guess. Sure. Yeah. Like it wasn't, yeah. But it, to see how people were being treated for voicing their opinions is pretty fucking, pretty rubbish. Um, There was a lot of, not a lot, but there was a handful of people doing similar things to you with that stuff when it was everywhere. Um, But you've stuck with it. Have a lot of those other sort of people kind of gone, oh, we've moved on to something else now? I think they're probably, some of them are, Perhaps no. Within within those circles, a lot of them went back to being wellness grifters, <laughs> which is kind of where they started off. So a lot of them made a lot of money uh, through fundraising during that period of time. They put up put it uh, put forward a lot of bogus legal um, claims and a lot of merchandise and a lot of this sort of thing. They made a bunch of money, and then they've kind of gone back into wellness. So uh, it was some of the biggest um, media and uh, media leaders on in the freedom movement uh, do things now like they sell juice cleansers or they'll sell they become influencers they'll, yeah they've become influencers and they do wellness retreats and stuff like that uh, and they really have a cult of personality around them some of them have completely died off and don't do anything but they will they, all of these groups are at the moment waiting for their next big moment to emerge mm. and it was the same with leftist groups during COVID when they were all um, yeah locked inside um, doing their part to stem the spread of COVID, as we were told. Um, and then as soon as this uh, conflict uh, between Israel and Palestine emerged, they've all come out of the woodwork and ha- are organising in ways that we haven't seen in Australia in decades. And it's been really fascinating and really interesting to see um, all those groups emerge and all of the quite radical and quite, like in many instances, quite brave um uh, protests that they've done, protest actions that they've done, yeah. Yeah. Um, it sounds bad, but are some people just in it to fucking stir shit up and they don't really care what the cause is? Yeah. Yeah? Of and course. you could spot them? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And that's, like, that's on both sides, yeah. Mm-hmm. A, a lot of people go to protests because it's fun and and it can be really fun to punch on with police and it can be really fun to punch on with the other side Um and it's made even funner when you have a strong ethical or moral um, foundation to back up what you're doing. Yeah. And, yeah, there's definitely um, – and I don't want to call them troublemakers. You know, that's a bit uh, dismissive, a uh, bit patronising, but people that purely go just for the fun of the punch-on. For the thrill, yeah. For the thrill. Mm. Um, and – but it's – you know, this is – by far the minority of people. Um, And I still think even those people, yeah, are still there for the political reason. They just also believe that violent direct action action is a um, important part of... Do you think any of those bigger organisations had hired muscle that they go, we'll just get these people in because they'll kick up a bit of a, a ruckus that didn't actually work down for the cause necessarily by bigger organizations you mean oh well some of the bigger groups that are all organizing this sort of stuff was they was everybody down for the cause or were some of the people like we get these guys in because we know they're gonna fucking kick up a stink and we're gonna you know get our message heard better mm, no nah, i wouldn't i i wouldn't be placed to say that but i i think in the freedom movement there was a lot of blokes that love a punch on um it was I suppose that that side of politics really embraces hyper masculinity. Mm. So a lot of them, yeah, really wanted to show that they were warriors and tough and, you know. Like brave heart shit. Brave heart shit. Quite literally, they would, yeah. you know, recite lines word for word. But uh, I suppose on the other side of um, the political spectrum, I'd say it's more organic. Just people like, and I, you know, I was at um, a rally on the weekend or two weekends ago. Uh, where there was the pro-Palestine protesters and there was people there that um, were, you know, getting violent um, with the Zionists and also with police and it was deeply emotional. Like, they seemed deeply emotional, uh, deeply emotionally invested in uh, this issue and that's probably an aspect of where the violent uh, agitation came from and partly because they think that it's important to fight or make Zionists or make fascists feel uncomfortable on the street. That's mm. That would be what they would say, yeah. 
Yeah, it leads you into a into a very difficult um, place when you've got so many pro Palestine people, but they're not necessarily anti Jewish, but then the Jewish people feel that they are because they're anti Israel, and it's it gets gets messy. Yeah, well, this is the whole um, issue that I explored in my most recent video, uh, where I went to what was marketed as an anti uh, anti semitism rally, so they were opposing anti semitism or what they deemed anti uh, anti semitism. Yes. <laughs> So they saw rising anti-Semitism in yep. Australia as a threat, which is fair. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is rising anti-Semitism. Sure. Um, and But the irony of it was that it was run by uh, Christian evangelicals who have traditionally not been uh, in Again, any... you've got two opposites sort of coming together. Complete opposites. Um, and these Christian evangelicals believe... So it's the Zionists at this rally believed that it was in a rally against anti-Semitism but it was actually a pro-Israel rally. Um, and they completely denied that it was a pro-Israel rally. They were like, this isn't about Israel. It's got nothing to... Meanwhile, there's Israel flags everywhere and all the speeches are about Israel. Um, the Christian evangelicals support uh, the Zionists because within Christian evangelical uh, religious doctrine, the Jews need to be in control of Israel in order for the end of the world to happen and Jesus to return. Right, so it's a doomsday prophet prophecy. That's deep, man. It's 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 bizarre and and absurd, and it doesn't actually support the safety of Jews. It's just about we need this prophecy to occur, and so you guys need to be in control. So it was a really bizarre event, and but everyone I talked to at the event just talked about the exact same thing, which was um, essentially anti-Semitism. Uh, which I understand because all of their policies, all of their belief systems are rooted in intergenerational trauma to deal with. Every single person I talked to had a family member that died in the Holocaust, right? So all of their beliefs and opinions are uh, completely ruled by that trauma mm. and they cannot see anything objectively and they cannot look at this conflict objectively uh, they can only see their own safety um, and their own trauma. And they've been touched personally, which makes it even deeper. Exactly. And so I understood that and, I under and I've always understood that about, um, about Israel, that it is deeply personal to Jewish people and that's what makes it so challenging. But we've gotten to a point now where uh, the term anti-Semitism has been so diluted by... Uh, Zionists on the far right that will just use it to uh, dispel any criticism of Israel whatsoever and we're seeing the most horrific images imaginable coming out of Gaza and it actually puts Jews at risk because we're all on the internet. We can see the comment sections that are blatantly, uh, you know, spreading anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy theories. There's a lot of people talking about um, Hitler and how perhaps Hitler was right and stuff like that about Jews because of the actions of Israel. And by diluting anti-Semitism to, to mean any criticism of Israel whatsoever, we're actually avoiding the real dis uh, discussion around, yeah, anti-Semitism is growing in, in, in Australia, in the world, and it is putting Jew Jewish people at risk. Um, but it's not anti-Semitism isn't just criticisms of Israel. And that's where these people really were just coming up short because they just it would, any criticism of Israel whatsoever was anti-Semitism. And I found that really difficult to, to challenge because it's just so rooted in their identity and, and in their personal lived experience that it's, you can't really find common ground with it. And it, it hits home even more because there's such a huge... Jewish population in, in Melbourne. I lived in East St Kilda for the last almost 20 years and it's a huge Jewish population. So you can't help but feel for those people that have potentially have nothing to do with it and they're being victimised as well, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, it, you know, it's not a new thing either. Like a lot of the reporting that I was doing during COVID was about anti-Semitism and how uh, the pandemic was like 
yeah, yeah caused those, by Jewish people or the parties that was yeah that were and it was a big thing in the freedom movement. A lot of the freedom movement was like, but that plays into their hands because what are they? They're potentially neo Nazis. So yeah, but, yeah. So it's really challenging, and and For sure, and yeah, it's, it's how, it's a how rough do you space. go about being as neutral as possible in these scenarios, getting people from both sides of the picket line, so to speak, to talk to you and. Because you don't want them to think that you're on their side, but you don't want them to think that you're on the other side. So how do you navigate that? That's tough. I'm, I'm honestly, I'm a kill them with kindness type of reporter. Yeah. Uh, I just go in with a big smile. Uh, I let people feel comfortable. Often I'll talk to them for twenty minutes. I might only, you know, m- maybe only a two minutes of the interview can yeah. air. I'm, I can't obviously show the whole thing, but I'll make them feel comfortable over the course of the interview, where they will be able to share their true feelings about. The issue. A lot of people are really apprehensive towards interviews. I totally understand why. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a TikTok generation. People don't want a little cut of themselves on the internet um, that makes them feel uh, silly or unheard or perhaps, you know, without context. Uh, so it's all about making sure that they feel comfortable and happy to talk to you. For yeah. sure. Yeah, for something like what we are just talking about, obviously you can't really take a humorous you know, edge to it. But with the freedom stuff and with other protests, you see maybe it's easier to poke fun at the well, pro- pro-abortion people and that sort of thing. Yeah, this, you know? this was the struggle that I had with um, this Israel-Palestine issue over the last six months is that a lot of the stuff I do is rooted in satire. Yeah. and But when you're talking about such deep topics like that, that's hard. Like the pro-life people or... You know, right wing people, you could be like, all right, we can play on this a bit. But when you're talking about someone who believes that, you know, that's hard to put some satire in there. Yeah. Ultimately, when you're talking to people that are powerless, for instance, uh, you know, the anti abortion people, like, they're not, they don't, they don't have wide support, widespread support whatsoever. So they might be out, you know, in numbers, but they don't have that much power. And the same with the freedom not protesters. Here, not here. Not here, but in America, In, in America, sure. they would, depending on where you are in the country, but in most of the country, they are the majority. For sure, and yeah. And on the internet, they would just see that. Yeah, 100%. But I suppose with Israel-Palestine, like especially when I'm interviewing Zionists, it is a lot more challenging because uh, they do have, you know, an element of power in, in Australia. And, you know, at their rallies, they had... Peter Dutton speaking, you know, at the freedom protesters, they had some random hippie, uh, you know, there's a big difference in the power dynamic there. And so when I'm speaking to them, I, I, I feel like it is my, like it is my journalistic responsibility to challenge them and to, um, ensure that they are, um, you know, responsible for the beliefs that they, um, spruik. But at the same time, there is a safety aspect for me, uh, I don't want to be surrounded by a bunch of people accusing me of being an infiltrator or accusing me of being from the other side. So I do have to toe a certain line with kindness and, and apprehension where I um, can ask them questions that, yeah, make them, make them feel comfortable to open up, but don't make them scream infiltrator, get him, you know? <laughs> and that's, that is a challenge because it hasn't ever actually happened to me before but i feel like it's always one moment away what about post when you when you when you post these things online have people message you and said man you took me out of context and i fucking look like a dickhead now you know people have yeah. and you know what every single time that that has happened and i think it would have happened a handful of times maybe four or five every single time it's happened the person that was filmed and that uh that was you know represented in the piece had personally shared it on their Instagram in support of it initially and and then read the comments and then it come back to me being like, hey, can you actually take this down? And I was, and I'm always like, no, sorry, this is journalism. The only time I ever did take it down was when I was doing something with uh, teenagers. So they were like 15 years old, 14, 13 years old. Um, And you actually had some of them on this podcast, you you know, Forte? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, it was, it was, it He's 19 now, but it might have been some of the younger kids. Yeah, there. so it wasn't him. He was happy to have the documentary up. Um, but it was some of the younger kids that I'd gone out to Altona to meet and they were making their own uh, bicycles with motors on them. Yeah. Um, it was really sick. And 
they were whizzing around doing police chases, all this sort of thing. And when I uploaded it, they were all blowing up my phone like, this is really red hot. Um, you need to take this down. We're going to get in trouble. I de-identified them completely. There was no way they were going to get in trouble. But as I said, I'm a youth worker and my the importance for me is young people's safety. For sure. And it's not worth the you know no. minor clout that I might get on the internet for this video for their personal safety and well-being. So I took it down immediately. Yeah. Let it cool off for a bit. Let it cool off. Yeah. When there's adults and you're responsible for what you say on, on camera, you know? For sure. Yeah. Um, and look, that's something that is a great issue in the community that kids and even grown-ups don't think about what they put online and how it can be detrimental to them. I'm sure there's probably a lot of people that were saying shit two years ago in the middle of lockdowns that they're probably going through their Facebook memories now and deleting, you know what I mean? Like mm. there is that once it's on the internet, it's there and... It, it can bite you in the ass. It can come back to hurt you. People don't realise that sometimes. That's why I think all journalists should be, have a background in social services, uh, youth work or something like that, so that they can they actually live in the communities that they report on mm. um, or, uh, you know, work with the communities that they report on. Uh, a lot of journalists, yeah. I, I mean, if you look at the background of a lot of journalists, uh, a lot of them are private school kids. Um, a lot of them, yeah, uh, uh, spoon-fed sort of this... Uh, yeah, I could have. Yeah, well, it's a bit of a. It's look. I went to a public school, and when I think of a, someone studying journalism, I think of a private school kid from an elitist background who, you know, is a member at the MCC. That's just my sort of, you know. But you'd probably be right to be <laughs> honest. And you know, that doesn't mean that they're not good journalists. I think there's amazing journalists out there. So many good journalists out there. Um, but yeah, it is important to have that lived experience um, and context within communities and whether you work with work in them or, or live with them, um, it just makes your reporting better, I but think. But see, that is the exact reason why I think someone like Spanion becomes a cult figure because he acts and is relatable to the masses. The people that you see on TV wearing the double-breasted blazers talking down about kids that are in trouble... They can't relate to that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's why. So there's like, yeah. And that's why alternative media as a whole has become so popular because for so long media has been fed to us by, um, yeah, and I don't want to use the term like elite or anything like that, but they're just people that aren't in our uh, financial demographic or cultural demographic. They're... It's kind of its own cult. Like the, the culture of mainstream journalism is completely unique, and it doesn't exist in day to day. So even the accent, it doesn't exist. Like people don't speak like that. Yeah. You know, I, I would so often I would go to these protests, and there would be mainstream media journalists, and they would be wearing top to bottom suit and tie. They'd try and go to talk to someone, and they'd be like, "Piss off! I don't want to talk to you." Yeah. Um, and I completely understood why. Why would I talk to someone in a suit? Whereas I come over, I just dress like them, yeah. and I go, "Hey, man, I'm independent media. I've just..." you know, trying to hear what you guys are all about. All of a sudden you're And on suddenly side. it's yeah. like, oh, well, yeah, absolutely. If you're independent, I'll tell you everything. Mm. Um, and that's really the unbecoming, like the what's, what's going to be unbecoming about mainstream media is that they're just not relatable anymore. No. And the people that they are relating to are, it's going to sound bad, but slowly dying. You know, it's the, it's the people that are even older than my parents. It's like my grandparents' generation. They're the people that watch the news and believe it. Yeah. Even, you know, people in their 50s and 60s, they're not fucking, they're not buying that shit anymore. Yeah. It's because it's all we had, really. 100%. For and, such a long time. And I'm, I'm not, you know, one of these fully anti-mainstream media uh, people. I, I consume a lot of mainstream media myself and I know when to discern what is uh, informed by their sponsorship deals and what is informed by actual... Uh, rigorous journalistic ethics and a lot of mainstream media does not cut the mustard in that terms but there are fantastic journalists in mainstream media the issue is the establishments themselves absolutely um, drain these journalists of their creative integrity and um, yeah. they have to tow the company line exactly and that's what's really sad I think um, about it all because there is a certain journalistic ethic that can be maintained with mainstream media that can't be uh, maintained in alternative media. So you look at someone like Spanion, right? And I agree, Spanion has been really successful in um, being relatable uh, 
and even though you know we don't all stab people um, and we all haven't been to jail, there's just a certain um, relatability there that you know it, it, it's it's perhaps a little bit unpretentious, right? Um, and he'll go into his own communities that he knows about and be able to tell their stories. The the issue is that there is no journalistic oversight on Spanian stuff, and what and the only editor of and I don't know much about him, but it is literally like a kid in his early 20s does all of the editing for Spanian's videos. And so you have a program, um, something like Into the Hood, that's being broadcast at a level of a current affair, like to a... Uh, probably a, bigger viewership. Probably bigger. It's a massive viewership, right? And the editorial oversight on that program is literally by a kid in his early 20s who perhaps has no lived experience in those um, public housing... Uh, blocks that he goes to and he essentially gets to decide what makes the cut and what doesn't make the cut and that's what's dangerous uh, in my opinion yeah but there's always editing involved in everything and you know you'll you, you'll hear it all the time people be like oh i did this interview and they only used three seconds and I, they didn't you know, when you go to do an interview when you when you do anything like that i don't chop this shit up at all like it is what it is mm -hmm. but a lot of people especially with mainstream they're only going to take a little snippet and it might be you might be saying something and they take it out of context and that's all it is. There's always going to be editing in every capacity. Yeah. No, of course. And I edit as well. Um, but I would, yeah, I suppose I would argue that I, I have this, um, I believe in the tenets of journalism and fair journalism and the code of ethics that go into being a journalist. And that's what I try to maintain within all of my content whereas when you're in youtube where it's not really journalism but it kind of is like going into these uh public housing blocks like it's i know it's entertainment it's supposed to be um you know uh, somewhat educational but ultimately like an educational program but it does feel like journalism mm. but it, there is no journalistic code of ethics that's being followed here no it's just let's go into someone's house and and see, but see some crazy uh, shit. As somebody who I only really watch documentaries, I try to. Um, I don't really watch, you know, any fictional stuff. So I will watch things like that and, and I find it interesting, you know. He's gone to places that I've driven past a lot and never gone in there and I'm like, oh, fuck, that's what Park Towers is like. I've got friends that used to live there at school but I've never been inside. So it is interesting in that perspective because it from the voyeuristic thing, you're like, okay, I get it now. But... It doesn't necessarily, like you said, it could be edited in a bad way, but I think that it has a lot more substance in that realistic stuff than than anything you're going to find on mainstream television. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and it's and the I'm future. definitely I'm definitely not I'm not here to criticize oh, no, that. No, 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 um, no, no. no I, but but the reason why I say that is because when I recently um, uh, made a bit of a hoo ha about Spanian going to Park Towers because I work there. Oh, that's um, where you. I didn't know that. Yeah, oh, so I okay. work. I work at Park Towers. Okay, so I went to school with a lot of kids from there. Yeah, exactly. Cool. And so when when he went there, I wasn't. You know, I'm, I'm not fully um, saying that what he made was bad. Yep. Um, and I feel like when I wrote an article about this, um, the mainstream media journalist that I talked to kind of wanted me to paint a narrative where I was like fully anti Spanian, Spanian going. I am absolutely not. But there is one thing that does kind of piss me off about um, his representation of these public housing um, projects is that he really only focuses on the negatives, yeah, for sure. and it's quite it can be quite disheartening for the young people that I work with at Park Towers when there's literally there are full blown heroes in that tower mm. that are feeding people every single week like they 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 live in this tower. They volunteer 10 hours a day um, feeding people, like the most vulnerable people in yep. our community, um, every single day and it wouldn't hurt to give them yeah. a bit of a platform and be like, look at this hero doing something. No, it's all just misery. Green, yeah, I, I don't know whether that's know. off brand. Like when he does... I know, that's what's sad. Is I it, know. Is I it that it's off brand? When he does the positive spins, it's gen generally like, oh, they've got a gym where kids can come and box because that's more on brand. It's more the UFC kind of stuff. I think, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Um, man, I had no idea that that's where you worked as a youth worker. Yeah. I've, yeah, I've got some connections to that place with, I went to school there, which mm -hmm. with a lot of kids from there and where I went to school and my partner went to school, it was pretty much, I'd say about 80% kids from the housing commission. And then 20% people like ourselves that didn't, 
live in the housing commission but didn't have the money to go to private school and we were kind of all thrown into this school mm-hmm. and you'd know the school now, right? They've rezoned that school and I believe I've heard from past teachers that Park Towers is now out of that zone. How the fuck can they do that? Yeah, well, it is insane what public schools get away with these days with young people. Like, yeah, a lot of the kids I work with when they're 12 years old, they'll become 13, they have to go to high school. They're getting stitched up with twelve hundred dollars for a blazer, for a public school. I don't know. I don't know how people think a, a, a newly arrived family, um, migrant family, refugee family, or you know intergenerationally working class um, family that's lived in Australia for for years perhaps has um, you know substance abuse issues or you know whatever might be going on. How they can afford twelve hundred dollars for a blazer? That's and just how the much blazer. A blazer is. That's just the blazer. It is insane what these public schools put working families through. Is um, that a vetting way to make sure they go to another school? I don't know. I don't know. Um, to be honest, the the community, the young people at Park Towers are brilliant. Um, my my housemate works at Collingwood uh, Towers and. Uh, there's a lot of issues with young people there, a lot of gang stuff going on. Um, we don't experience that at Park Towers. A lot of the young people are really studious, really switched on. Uh, it's actually the older people at Park Towers that have, um, you know, substance abuse issues that bring more of the notoriety of Park Towers these days. Mm. Um, and the fact that the building is completely decimated, it's falling apart. Um, it was one of the first ones. I think it was the first one. Mm. Yeah, and it's... It, it, it's atrocious that people have to live in that in those conditions. It's an indictment on the government. It, it's these these sorts of issues that are what I wish the freedom protesters focused on with the Labor government, um, but they're focused on conspiracy theories. Yeah. But there are serious, you know, uh, issues with all the public housing blocks that it's just, yeah, decades of mismanagement. And, A lot. So, yeah, that's where I grew up around that area. And some of the other ones that are in um, South Melbourne, Port Melbourne, uh, they've, the ones in Port Melbourne in Garden City, like Barrack Road Flats, they've knocked down totally. There was people that lived there. I, like, I went to school with and primary school with that had lived there for like 35 years. Mm -hmm. So they've been displaced. And what's the, what's the the game plan? Obviously, they're looking at it. They're going, that house across the road's worth four million dollars. We've got people living in government housing here. Is that them just being greedy? Is that the council and the government being greedy and thinking we can we can repurpose this land, which is prime land? I think it's the government trying to offset a lot of their spending by uh, pushing working families out of nice areas and pushing them out into the suburbs. And yeah, so with Barrack Beacon, they were, I think that was part of the public housing renewal initiative or something along those lines. Um, where a lot of the lower, low-rise um, public housing blocks have been knocked down um, and they're going to be replaced with mixed mm. public-private so social housing. They did housing. Ingle Street, I think. They did, uh, yeah. And they did also in the public housing block that was around the corner from where I grew up in Northgate. Um, and it's really challenging for the people that live there um, because, yeah, a lot of them really struggle with change um and one of the privileges of public housing one of the few privileges is that you do get to keep your place forever Mm. um and suddenly you're not good enough to have the spot on the beach which is so Um, like it's capitalism gone wrong yeah mad yeah and it's really sad because you know in the in the context of park towers like park towers will get knocked down um in 10 years and you know whether right or wrong i'm I'm not going to debate that is that what that's locked Um, in it's it's the policy's there. It's not locked in. No, nothing's locked in. That's the problem with with this public housing renewal is that nothing is ever locked in. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it'll just be knocked down, and then there will be a vague contract about something being real, but re- rebuilt. But nothing's ever locked in. But that community at Park Towers is really strong, and it's really uh, tight knit, and people uh, really rely on each other in so many different respects. And it, when it is re- replaced with mixed living. A lot of those, you know, really vulnerable people um, that have found solace with this community uh, will be mixed in with yuppies that want to move to Port Melbourne uh, who want nothing to do with a community and just want 
you know, a nice little apartment in South Melbourne uh, where they, you know, have their little lives and whatever. You know, no shade on them, but these communities are really, really integral to the well-being of a lot of these people. It's yeah. communities in integral to all of our well-being. No. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, I, whenever I would visit my friends growing up that were in um, some of these buildings, there was a real camaraderie and everyone kind of looked after each other and you're from Parkies, you're from Knott Street, you know, like everyone knew each other, everyone kind of, yeah. You start to mix in people that have different kind of ideals and it, it's I couldn't even imagine how it's going to work, you know? No, no one can. <laughs> That's the nightmare. Yeah. I think I lived on Chapel Street for a bit uh, just between Elma and Inkerman, and I think they did it with the building that's there. Mm-hmm. It seems to be successful. I don't know. It looks like it's a brand new apartment building, but I think they tried to do that mixed thing there. Is there case studies where it actually does work? There must be for them to keep doing it, or are they just try until. <laughs> I don't know, and, and I'm not gonna. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I I'm not educated enough on whether or not. Uh, but it's got to be it something that you'd be dealing but with. What yeah. definitely would work, to be honest, no. I'm usually just dealing with the problems of the young people. But yeah, um, but they have to. That's a flow on effect, though. For sure, for sure. But they have no idea what's going on. They, they they feel so powerless within that building because for the last two years they've had an infestation of cockroaches, and no matter how many times they call the department, they won't come down and fix it. You know, it's. It, they had a fl- they had flooding in one third of the building, um, like a third of the apartments had to be evacuated, and the concrete must be concrete must be fucked though in that place, man. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and so and but the like, yeah, people don't understand. Like if you don't live, if you didn't grow up in public housing, you're do- not exposed to public housing. You don't understand how bad the government is at being a landlord. Like, they're just so insanely incompetent. And it's not because the idea of public housing is bad. The idea of public housing is incredibly important to a lot of people. Um, it's just that the, you know, Homes Victoria or whatever are just so um, yeah, underfunded and they don't have enough... Um, like, I think Park Towers, all the responsibility of all the apartments is one agent. And that's 350 uh, apartments for one agent. Yeah. So, they and might have uh, all have their individual struggles and troubles and exactly. multiple residents in one place. Fuck. Exactly. And so, and in, in the private, uh, in private real estate, I think one agent to about 80 properties is the norm. Well, I know um, some people that would disagree, but it depends. I, I, don't, I don't know. That's what I've been told. Yeah, I, I wouldn't yeah. know. Um, but yeah, 350 is, and, and 350 of, the like some of the most challenging yeah. tenants <laughs> you could imagine yeah and so yeah it's just a nightmare it's it's i feel really bad for the people that you know have to live in those circumstances it's it's awful so it's just yeah i don't know it's it it can be challenging to see spanian come in and 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 make a video that doesn't bring light to the people that are trying to change it i suppose and improve it yeah at what stage you've got us think is this like poverty porn is this like ghetto porn you yeah. know it sounds bad but you know what i mean yeah that's and then because basically yeah th- th- this happened with another kid who is like another youtuber um and who did not have the lived experience of spanian at all um and he went to park towers and filmed just the most awful video it was styled more like a ghost hunting video with like um you know cheap ghost music and I've seen like, this on your page yeah, yeah yeah and it was appalling and it was just like it was really disheartening for the residents to watch that about where they live like young people seeing that about how they live like it's really disrespectful you know this is their community um so yeah put a positive spin on it and say this is shit we need to fix this not oh, i can't believe you yeah. guys are living in this filth that's the wrong angle to be t- and i understand that that's not like spanian's not interested in that he's no. been very open about how he's not he's not interested in making change he just wants to document and that's fine that's great yeah. whatever you do your thing um but it would just be nice to you know it would For be sure. nice For i sure. feel like it's a missed opportunity yeah and it is hard when someone has such a, a large audience, you think, yeah, how can we bring some positivity? Yeah. But uh, anyway, um, that's enough about him. <laughs> I had no idea you are at – that's a bit of a spin out, man, because, yeah, I've spent a lot of time in that area. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, there you go. Um, let's get back onto your journalistic sure. journey. So what – aside from the freedom stuff, aside from what we've touched on, what are some of the other kind of things that you wanted to document from a sort of protest or from a, you know – 
whatever what what do you even deem your your manner of which you do it it's you're looking for not looking for conflict but you you want to see where the conflict is you want to be there yeah i definitely want to be there i love the chaos and the conflict of a protest a lot of what motivates me is humor like i love satirical stuff mm-hmm. um i love when people say things that maybe they don't realize is the really funny gas, no break sort of stuff yeah exactly um and uh, I, I, sp- I suppose I have in the past maybe found it challenging, more challenging to do uh, authenticity, like when people are being genuinely authentic about um, their political beliefs in a way that isn't um, satirical or isn't funny or anything like that. I have found at times that to be challenging to to present it in a way that's still entertaining because mm. we like – you know, if you're in activist circles or you're exposed to activist circles on the internet, there's just endless content of someone standing in front of a camera and being like, this is why we're here and this is what's so important to me and I will continue to fight this at la, la, la. And there's, yeah, it's almost a, it's, it's, it's almost just an inundation of content like that. Yeah. And I, I want it to be entertaining. I want it to be interesting and I want people to laugh. Even if they're laughing because it's like... Uh, a depressive laugh like oh my god this is just what does the world come to laugh mm. that's fine i like jarring content mm. i want people to feel on edge um and i want them to be like exposed to yeah i suppose the reality of the world yeah the you want people, people think that are at home on their phones to feel like they're actually kind of there exactly getting a, a legitimate slice of what it's like if you were on burke street or at the steps of you know, yeah. yeah, and a lot of that comes down to editing. I spent a lot of time, like, finessing, especially the audio. Like, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, this needs to click perfectly with the audio. And I think that's a lot of, like, journalism platforms or social media platforms. They're uninterested. They just want to get content out, pump content out. I'm definitely a quality over quantity person, um, and I'm like, everything needs to be uh, perfect, sound wise and visual wise to really illustrate the chaos of a, of a scenario, of a situation. Um, yeah, so often I'm, I'm, I get, often I get stuck on yeah. that. So how do you juggle your full-time gig with if there is going to be some sort of a protest or something on, you know, that's, they can be on at any given day. Like yeah. the freedom stuff was every Saturday. I'm just like, you know, bang, bang, bang. Yeah. yeah, the truth is I don't. Like I, I don't really manage it. I, I often miss stuff. Uh, and I wish I didn't, but yeah, even the other day I took a day off work to go to a, um, Israel, Palestine stuff at a university. And then I went to the wrong university. So, so <laughs> that seems to be a common thing. I know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Melbourne uni was sort of popping off. I think wasn't Melbourne it? uni was popping off. I went to Monash. So yeah, Monash frust- is out in the burbs, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. It was a long way for me. Um, so it was frustrating just because I, I do have limited opportunities and often stuff is interstate. And I, yeah, one of the protests that I went to, I literally uh, decided I was lying on the on, on my bed at 8.30 p.m. Um, and I heard over the radio, they, were, they had like this, um, their own internal radio, the protesters, the activists, um, that, they were, that they were all doing a convoy to Canberra. And I was lying in bed, I was like, I'm going to go. And that I got, happened quickly, yeah. That that quickly. And I got in my car at 8.30 at night and I started driving to Canberra. I slept on the side of the road in Wodonga and then kept going in the morning, caught up with the convoy and it was thousands of cars. And I got to Canberra and I filmed content all day um, and the next day. And I just had to do it. Like I just actually had to go and do it. And luckily, um, you know, I have people that donate. So when I did that, people really liked the content. A lot of people donated uh, to pay for my fuel and, you know, a little bit on the top. Um, Are they just fans or have they got a certain agenda that they want you to push? Some of them were fans. Uh, a lot of them were fans. I did see some mainstream journalists uh, send me money because they had, uh, like, send me money somewhat anonymously through just, just through PayPal because they respected the work I did and they knew that, their mainstream outlet was using my footage verbatim without any credit um, and without any money towards me because that's what mainstream journalists, mainstream media, sorry, does with social media content. 
Do you reckon the higher ups have said we can't be seen to be giving this guy money, but if it comes from you personally, we'll you know? Or do you think they, they were the, just they were just being there? There's being they don't have to. So the the policy is that anything that's on social media they can use. Um, they it's a courtesy for them to provide um, uh, credit. Like I think when Media Watch produced, uh, sorry, when Media Watch featured my uh, content, they did put a, um, a credit. But yeah, there's there's a lot a lot of instances of my stuff being used by a whole range of uh, mainstream outlets, and often you know it is credited, but there's no money. Mm. Like I've travelled across the other side of the country to go, taking my own time out of my life. Yeah. I, I I make no money, mm. um, and I can't even invoice anyone. It's 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 more symptomatic of the journalism industry as a whole. There's just no money. Yeah, I guess you the way to th- combat that would be to set up as like a freelancer and then to say, I've got this content. Who wants to use it? You've got to buy it off me. By the time that that's all happened, the story's fucking done. This, this is it. Exactly. Yeah. Like I could do that. But the reason why my content is spreading so far is because I am the one that's there. I am the one that's there before anyone else. Yep. I'm the one that followed the the um, convoy. Yeah, the convoy in the middle of the night. Mm. Uh and so it wouldn't be news once I've, you know, gone mm. around and gotten some commissioning uh, public from a public publication to run it. It's yeah. like when you mentioned uh, Media Watch, are we allowed as far as mainstream media goes? Are we allowed to like Media Watch? Because I, I love Media Watch. So good, yeah, man. it's great. The guy is so smug, and it's amazing. Yeah, like no, Media Watch is great. Um, and I, I love how. Nothing's off limits and he will even pull up ABC. Like he doesn't care. Of they course. love taking the piss out of the low-hanging fruit of Channel 7 and Channel 9. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he'll still do it to ABC. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Media Watch is fantastic. Uh, I love it. I've always watched it ever since I was really young. Um, and I think that it's really important to understand media liter- literacy through the scope of something like Media Watch mm. because they're just... Uh, yeah, there's just so many instances of mainstream media and, you know, even non-mainstream media um, pushing narratives purely because it supports their sponsorships um, and it uh, supports their advertisers. Well, that's why ABC is supposed to not have an agenda because it doesn't have, but then it gets fucking political. You know what I mean? Mm. Like some of my friends will be like, ABC is worse than fucking the other channels because they've got their own political, like, fuck. How do you have any any sort of outlet that doesn't have any political ties except for someone like yourself who makes no money? Yeah, I think I don't know. It's it's really challenging. Um, I think ABC probably attracts journalists generally from the political left, um, but I don't know. I mean, this whole Israel Palestine thing has uh, definitely shown that ABC is not part of the established political left because they haven't been in any way towing uh, the line that... Well, they haven't been hypercritical of Israel at all. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, it's just... I don't know. It's and, and, the, and the people that run ABC at the top, they're not in any way leftists. Like, they're part of... Um, yeah. They're, they're not they're, they're not part of that world. They're not, <laughs> like Ida Butrose is not part of that row that that um, that world whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. Um, with the, some of the sort of things that you attend, when you see the public frustrated at the people who are the activists, that's a whole different thing as well. Because sometimes those people are just frustrated because this shit's getting in the way and they've got to go meet their family or whatever, that's confronting as well. It's like a whole different sort of picket line as well, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, I think that's really, it's always really interesting um, because it all comes down to political communication, right? And so when I'll go to like a pro-Palestine rally um, or like perhaps an anti, uh, perhaps an anti-fascist rally against like people that are anti-trans or something like that and you see a lot of these like young um, university students, activists um, that, uh, you know, balaclava it up and getting really hectic um, and not to criticize them at all you know they're doing their thing that's what they think is important um, in terms of political activism but then you'll sit you'll I'll pan to like 
a bunch of tradies on the side watching and they'll be just utterly bemused by it. They'll just be like, who are these people? What are they doing? What is the context? And within the context of protest culture, the kids in balaclavas makes complete sense. We see it all over the world. It's very common, common uh, form of um, political communication. But when you drop someone in from, you know, just like a normie from the mainstream Australia in that world, they're just like, what is this? What's going on? Yeah. Um, it's totally confusing. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. And then it was the same with uh, the freedom protesters, you know, like a, a lot of those, especially like the hippie well-being types, um, they weren't. I don't think people found them very relatable um, and they were like, yeah, I don't know, a bit too esoteric maybe. Yeah, the whole thing is is really interesting now because everybody has their own community online where they didn't have that, protesters didn't have that 20 years ago. Mm. So everybody in their little own, you know, forums, social media, they have their own echo chambers of what their idealism is and they all think they're doing the right thing. Yeah. So whether or not there's people there saying you're a dickhead on the other side of the fence, they believe that they're all doing the right thing, where that never really existed 20 years ago. And that just feeds the whole fucking, you know, the anger from every which direction. Yeah. The polarisation is crazy. That's it. That yeah. Well, there you go. That You've summed it up. In, the po- yeah. And yeah. that's... But everyone has their own lane of what they believe they're doing the right thing. And I... You know, I tend to think that it probably is worse than it ever has been... Or like in, you know, contemporary Australia perhaps. But again, I wasn't around back in the 70s. I don't no. know what the political polarisation was like then. But just ne- the... people couldn't network then to, to sort of believe, you know, like, yeah. Yeah, I suppose the, in- yeah, there's a, obviously a strong argument that the internet has made it worse through things like echo chambers, right? Um, but that's why I think this whole old school notion of protesters are uni students, right? Because back... Before the internet, where else did people recruit other people to go against yeah. the system? It was, you know, younger people in the universities. So that's why, and that's that label still sticks to this day. I suppose the biggest difference is that the left used to be a lot more uh, closely tied with working class people. Um, mm. And when I say working class, that was like people that worked in trades and stuff like that the reality is the working class has changed a lot in the last 30 years and a lot of the tradies uh, now probably earn more money and have um, more rights than an art student um, or a social worker or, um, you know... People holding lollipops are making more than people that go to university. Exactly. So the the working class has changed a lot, Mm -hmm. um, but that uh, demographic that was traditionally quite involved in leftist politics through unions uh, is no longer so much involved. Um, and what they ended up being involved in was the freedom protests, right? Yeah. And that's when you saw... Uh, well, the union one was crazy. Man. Yeah, and they went on They went on to the Westgate Bridge, which is objectively the coolest thing that's happened in Australian protest history for a long time. Um, but it was just very male... Very, um, but that one, that one in particular, then I wasn't there, and you probably were. Mm-hmm. I believe started with the protest at the union because they were mandating vaccinations, yeah. and then they got a whole bunch of other people because he came out the head of the union. They all had a go at him. Someone kicked the dog. You know what I mean? All that sort of shit. Like yeah. it was, it was that was crazy. It was cooked. <laughs> and then crazy. they, and but just knowing the city pretty well. To walk from North Melbourne, not North Melbourne, but wherever, where would it be? Yeah, it's kind of North North Melbourne, all the way through the city, up and down, around and over the Westgate, and end up in Footscray. That's a fucking long way, man. It didn't matter because everyone was pissed. Yeah, everyone was pissed. Everyone was on the gear. Like people were having fun, and this is where like the protest comes back. Like, n- not I would say ninety percent of people that were at that protest had never been to a protest before, and they suddenly realised that punching with police and getting rowdy just in the city yeah. and mob mentality is heaps of fun. Mm. And so they just, yeah, they took it all away. They took it all the way to the Westgate Bridge. Um, it was crazy. It was exciting. Um, again, I didn't necessarily agree with what they believed in, but um, I thought it was really cool. <laughs> yeah. And then the police came and shot them. <laughs> 
yeah. with rubber bullets. And it was like, I mean, it's funny because that, that same group I know would be the same type of people that would be complaining about someone blocking the highway when they're on the way to That's work. That's the thing, man. Yeah. Like <laughs> but when sure. it's them, it's fine. Fine. But they had a yeah. message. or They, they were, had a message again, because when yeah. you think you have a message, message. That's what then, I mean. That's everyone then it doesn't did. matter. Yeah, that's No one it, else man. matters. Yeah. For sure, yeah. That one was that was out of control. And the one at the shrine, which I think was a few days prior, was it? I think it was uh, uh, the uh, two days after. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that that's, was that was kind of the end. That was kind of when it finished. But it kind of needed to, I felt like. Yeah. How, yes. much, how much further could it go? Yeah. It was, yeah. Um, there was a question that I... Oh, yeah. I was going to bring this up. So what about the... January 26th, now that's a tough topic. Mm -hmm. It's easy to poke fun at the people there, like you had the video of the guy who didn't even know what he was talking about. Yeah. Proudly wearing his Australian flag. (laughs) Yeah. But that's a very polarizing uh, argument, which when you're going to, this is a really tough thing. When people have a protest against something, You've automatically, that's just an invitation to have a protest for something. So when people protest against January 26, people that are for it go, well, we're there too. Yeah. You're kind of inviting, you know, both sides. Totally. Which I found this year th- didn't happen. And I was really disappointed because I wanted to, to do a video on it. Um, and I could not find, not only could I not, there was no pro Australia Day protest. I couldn't find anyone in Melbourne celebrating Australia Day. It, was really disappointing for me. I, I went to all the beaches. I went everywhere. I tried to find one gazebo with an Australian flag where someone was celebrating. People would have been celebrating in their houses, but that's probably a really good reflection of where we're at in that discourse in Melbourne. Yep. Um, where, you go to Queensland, man, it'd be a fucking different story. Totally different story, yeah. Um, but, yeah, within Melbourne, people, if they're going to celebrate, they're celebrating it in private. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where we're at. We, you know, a few years ago, there was pro-Australia Day protests, um, but last year there was nothing. So I don't know. I think know. inevitably it's going to, the date's going to have to change sooner or later. People yeah. are going to vote with their feet and stop. You know, I don't think any business at the moment is calling it Australia Day. They all say the public holiday. Exactly. Yeah. So the, it's just not getting respected. Another really interesting thing that we, I, I had to, my, my son's almost five years old and, uh, we went past a house the other day and it had an Australian flag on it. And his kind has got an Australian flag, uh, Indigenous flag, and the um, Torres Strait Island flag. Mm-hmm. And he said, can we, like that, can we get one of those Australian flags at our house? This house had a pole with like a flagpole with an Australian flag. And I, my partner goes, oh, dad will handle this. And I'm like, I had to try and explain to a five-year-old that it's almost deemed to be racist to have the national flag at your house, which he's too young to comprehend that. But that's where we're at at the moment. Yeah. Which means either the flag's got to change, something's not right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I suppose it all all comes down to political communication again, right? And over the years, the Australian flag has, as a um, symbol, has been tarnished by um, successive campaigns. And whether right or wrong, like I personally, I'm not a huge fan of, the flag having the new Union Jack on it, right? That's what I'm, I'm not. I'm not about. super right. into it. But in terms of displaying your flag at the front of the house, for me, that's deeply American. That's it's like the flagpole at the front of the Australian flag. That for me <laughs> is like a sign of like almost American cultural imperialism, over like the top the, patriotism. Over the top patriotism. It's like we yeah. can all love Australia, mm. you know, if you want to, um, but. I don't need to be reminded that I'm in Australia. Like I know no. where I'm at, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to get a flagpole anytime soon. No, no, it just it just raised an interesting point that I had to explain to my son who knew what the Australian flag was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That it's not something that you usually fly proudly at the moment because people could deem that to be disrespectful to other people. Yeah. Which if that's the conversation that we're having with five-year-olds, then... If that's where it's sitting in the community, then surely something's got to fucking change. Uh, exactly, yeah. And I don't think that the politics is really, like the political establishment is really keeping up to speed with sentiments in the community. But again, we also live in Melbourne. so Where we're a bit more ahead of the game than some places. Yeah, well, I mean, I just think 
the political communication is different. In Melbourne, if you put up an Australian flag, there's probably, yeah, as you said, like a sentiment of like... Um, people you, would tell you, people would be fucking angry at you. Yeah, and, and, and in, order, like, in order to keep that up, I think that you would have to be purposefully dismissing the arguments against it. Whereas if you're in rural Queensland and that discourse isn't around, mm. no one cares about... People just love Australia and they love the Australian flag that discourse doesn't exist, then the p- political communication isn't the same. So you might just be flying it because, yeah, you just love Australia. Whereas in Melbourne, it feels more like I'm flying this because I'm trying to make a point. That is, I, which is, yeah, at the end of the day, it's the flag of your country though. So it shouldn't have those negative connotations, but somehow we found ourselves, that's where we're at. So I, something has to change. change and like, yeah. I don't know. Don't get me started on the monarchy, but I just don't even know why we need to have that union jack. We well, that's want, the thing. Yeah, right, we don't. Like, why do we know. need? What do we need? Yeah, that's yeah. we we don't we don't need it. Basically, no. No. <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. We all know that the housing situation, government is it government and community housing, public housing, public housing, is a problem. Now, they come to you, they say, Scoby, we we want you to fix this. <laughs> we've got we've got some significant resources and basically an unlimited budget for the next five years. What's your plan? What are you going to do? I've told you I'll put you on the spot, man, but look, this yeah, is the thing. I mean, no, I've, I mean, I, I, the things that initially come to mind would be, um, re, uh, sorry, renovate the, um, existing apartments rather to, than to, dozing them to modernize them. Why well, just, Dosing them is probably, yeah, just too long-term, um, too big of a budget. Uh, I know you said, I'm, you I know you said I'm limited, but um, long-term perhaps, right? Mm-hmm. But if you had, if you if we want results today or uh, quickly, then a lot of these apartments need to be renovated, modernised, um, things like leaks, uh, infestations, all these sorts of things fixed for young people uh, and for at-risk people. Uh, we need better um, services. So that means uh, funding key organisations that work in the towers. So um, there's fantastic organisations that do uh, youth programs in all the different uh, public towers that work really um, closely with the young people there. And um, some of them are sort of like not necessarily government funded. Some of them are organizations that do it like PCYCs and that sort of thing, aren't they? Yep. There's yeah. a lot of organizations that uh, are partially funded by government and partially rely on fundraising and they are really strapped for budget. Okay. Um, there's an organization called The Drum that works out of uh, Collingwood Flats. They recently were burgled um, and had a bunch of stuff stolen and it's really up in the air whether or not they're going to be able to replace a lot of these things. Um, and it's devastating for the young people because they really rely on those third spaces. Um, third spaces being not school, not home, but somewhere in between. With a positive uh, vibe. With a positive vibe where they can, um, you know, engage community and feel safe. A lot of the times, a, a lot of young people don't feel safe in their in their own homes um, uh, for whatever reason. Uh, and having that third place is really integral to their mental health Um to, you know, being, you know, growing as a young person. Um, And these organisations just simply don't receive enough funding Mm -hmm. to provide the necessary services for these young people. And then you have a lot of young people that, um, yeah, will get caught up in (sighs) crime and and drug use and all that sort of things that is really, yeah, obviously really challenging. So is the way forward for this community housing the mixed with private housing or do you think the segregation of the original you know plan from the 60s is still the way forward in my opinion i think public housing needs to stay public housing i think they need to increase the amount of public housing uh the issue with community housing is it doesn't provide the same stability as public housing so community housing for people sorry i might have got the terminologies no no it's fine so public there's a difference between community housing and and public housing um Community housing is usually uh, run by organisations such right. as there's like an organisation called Launch, uh, which uh, has community housing, but they don't provide the same stability and security that public housing does. When you're public housing, as I said before, you, you get, get it for term. life. Yep. 
Um, Until they decide it's worth too much in the land value. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the, but you always have a space in a house somewhere. They might just move you to a suburb that you have no idea. Happened uh, to a friend about. of mine. He went from Paran, where he'd been for a long time, and they moved him to Carlton. Yeah. You know. Yeah, exactly. Because they're renovating there. Yeah, and what do the, what do the kids do? <laughs> Suddenly they have to go to a new school. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so. Uh, yeah, I would increase the amount of public housing, um, obviously, dramatically. I would also really increase the amount of uh, uh, resources that Homes Victoria has so that they can actually effectively manage the, these um, these places. On a national scale, I'm guessing that every state has a different, slightly different sort of way to do it. Is Victoria... Good, bad, indifferent when it comes to the, the national... I think the Victorian Labor government has been on the forefront of this uh, neoliberal model of uh, mixed living where they... Which you're not about. No, I'm not about because it's it's more so about profiteering from the government or trying to write off, um, you know, their budget deficit. Uh, they're trying to basically make money out of the redevelopment when public housing is simply about providing low-cost housing for people that need it. And that's all it should be. It's not about profit. It's not about um, making money or, um, yeah, changing the demographic of an area. It's about giving people that need housing, housing. Because if we don't, they're on the street. Yeah. And then people complain about a homelessness crisis. Yeah, and it's just not a fucking, you know, the humanitarian thing to do. It's a human people. right to have housing. Exactly. exactly yeah. But so now with like, you know, to use a bunch of cliches, cost of living, rising prices of this and that and all that sort of stuff. And it is hard for people to find rentals. Mm -hmm. so, but I guess, and as someone who's never gone through that housing system, I'm guessing there's going to be a long wait list. And when you do, your number is up. You might be shipped off to somewhere that you don't necessarily want to be in. Oh, totally. It's tens of thousands of people, I think. Maybe even hundreds of thousands. I'm not sure. I think it's tens of thousands. And there might be new... Now that everything's becoming harder, the people that we're renting now privately might be like, let's get on this list because it's only going to get worse, blah, blah, blah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you don't know when your turn comes and suddenly you've lost your job or perhaps there's a um, you know family tragedy and, and you're in a situation where you can't pay rent and or can't pay as much rent as is expected out in the community now. Yep. Um, and public housing provides that that low cost uh, housing and crucially in suburbs that people can actually get jobs and that live. Is true. And so much of the, the, the government policy now is to push uh, public housing out into suburbs like Tarnit um, and they, they'll, you know, they'll get this individual house, which is great. But then a lot of these uh, families, you know, perhaps don't have the um, resources to drive all the way to work in the city or, yeah. or something like that. And there's not public very good public transport limited, yeah. out there. So a lot of these, um, you know, families will opt to stay in an apartment in the city, even if it's literally falling apart, it's flooded and everything because they have the convenience of living near where they work, which, you know, we all want, mm -hmm. um, and they have their community. And the government solution is, oh, no, Dari, we've got a brand new house out for you in Tarnit in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a where field. Where the infrastructure and where the jobs are. Yeah, and then you wonder why young kids are, you know, going around causing mischief in Tarnit when they don't have, you know, a third place yeah. to congregate, which is what these towers have. Yeah, and that when you say the third place, because that is a factor when it comes to bigger places like Park Towers, I'm guessing the Flemington Towers, Richmond, Paran, blah, blah, blah. But some of the smaller walk-ups and some of the clustered places, there is no third. Well, like, I guess there is community places, but I, I'm guessing they're few and far between now. Yeah. I suppose in the inner city, it's really, uh, you know, there's always an opportunity to find a third place, whether it's just a basketball court mm -hmm. um, or a local park or something. Yep. There is that opportunity. A lot of these newer suburbs, and I'm not, again, trying to show sh throw shade no, on them. No, but they're new. new suburbs, they're not established. But they don't. A lot of them were designed specifically without third places. And I'm a big fan of Tarnit. I love Tarnit. I work a lot in Tarnit. But the Tarnit third place is a supermarket, mm. is, a, is a mall. Yeah. Um, uh, and there are no, like, public spaces where young people can congregate um, and share culture and share community. Mm. And that's an indictment on the, you know, million-dollar property de developers that thought that they could build a community. 
But we're just looking for money, you know, because that's what they do. When you look at all these new housing estates and stuff, I think it takes them, I reckon, man, it must be like 30 years to get established communities to get people, like... Yeah. You look at them and you see that cafe looks manufactured, that thing, it just doesn't look and feel like a The community. trees haven't grown in. But yeah, well, yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah. So that it takes a long... You can't just open stuff and call it a community. A community has to build to thrive, you know? Sure. Yeah. I just... I totally agree. Um, and again, I love Titanic. I'm not <laughs> like, um, you know, there's amazing you name people. You name Titanic. Like, it just I, could have been anywhere. It, yeah, I, I name, exactly. Um, and there's really creative, interesting people that come from and live in Tiny. Um, but the property developers that created this place didn't have a third place in mind. They, yeah. they never do. Yeah. And there is also something that I've heard of a few of my friends that live in certain buildings are saying that some privately owned buildings and privately owned properties are being rented out by the housing um, what are they called homes victoria homes victoria yeah. and they're housing people in that because they can't keep up so is that something that's been happening forever or is that a new thing during the the, the list I'm, I'm not sure before? but actually, it is happening I, a lot now. i think it is happening yeah, yeah. but i'm not sure about that the time frame on that on now. that yeah and whether that's a trend that's going to keep continuing because they can't keep up with demand i guess yeah yeah. They're just not really building the necessary um, infrastructure for it. Mm. And when they are rebuilding something, they'll only put, you know, 25% as public housing. When they could have put the whole place as public housing, um, they'll only put 25% because they want to make a dime. With a lot of the people that are in that system, and not just in housing, but I think in renting now, the gap between people that have means and people that don't, is significant and it's only going to keep growing. We're in a dangerous place now and I feel that when people get stuck in a certain rut, whether it is housing or whether it is generational renting, it's going to be so hard for people to pull themselves out of that as, as everything becomes more and more hard to afford. Yeah, this is late-stage capitalism. and uh, This is what's happening is that, yeah, a lot of people are getting really, really wealthy and the mass majority of us are... Um, getting a lot poorer and, you know, we've seen with the cost of living crisis it's, how, it's much, how bad it can get. Totally. Um, but now I feel like if you're talking about a house costing basically a million dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Anywhere near... If you're lucky. <laughs> anywhere near a train line, yeah. I think you're going to be paying that much. Yeah. It, what's going to happen, and I think we're already almost there, is that kids are going to have to have had their parents been in the market. So it's not even up to you as an individual because you're going to take on a 30-year mortgage when you're 25 and you'll have to pay it off to you 55. If you don't have a leg up from your parents or your grandparents, then basically you're going to be chasing your tail for good and that's scary. Yeah, it's it's such a challenge. I mean, for me personally, I, the thought of purchasing a property is not even in and that's a the realm of for a possibility. Lot of it's so common. Um and I suppose I am, you know, privileged that my parents do own a property um, and that maybe one day, but in how long but will I be that's able, the reality of where you know, we live now. Yeah. But then, you know, then you have to consider that there's so many people in this country that only ever arrived in Australia in the 90s or in the 2000s um, who did not have the opportunity to get in the housing market whatsoever um, and they don't have the intergenerational wealth um, that people that have lived in this country longer have and they're only going to be more disadvantaged as time goes on. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it's you know... But the gap's widening. It, the gap is widening. And it's going to keep going. Of course. And I think that we'll find in 20 years' time people will say, oh, you own a house? That's amazing. Your grandparents must have had a house. That's where it's going to be. Yeah, exactly. And it's going to have nothing... And there's a few people, there's a few people that own hundreds of houses. Which um, is the shit thing. Yeah, and... This is something that was always really interesting when I would be uh, interviewing the freedom protesters is that, um, you know, a lot of them do uh, consider themselves from the right side of politics. So, um, you know, they would consider themselves libertarian or they don't believe in um, government uh, regulation or government restriction and that everyone has the right to, um, to you know, manifest their own destiny and, and make as much money as they like and, and you know, successful people to rise to the top and that's... That's that, that's human nature, right? Um, but then I'd I'd talk to them about it. And I'd be like, so you know, 
do you own a property? And they'd be like, oh, you know, I've tried, I've been owning one property, but like the mortgage is crazy. And I'm like, you know, I'm really down on my luck and it's, I'm really struggling. And then they'll be totally disgruntled and angry at the fact that billionaires and millionaires um, own dozens of properties, hundreds of properties. They'll come back to Bill Gates who owns like, I don't know, like a third of the farmland in, in the United States, something insane. Um, that's probably an exaggeration, but <laughs> but it's it's some ridiculous uh, figure. He's like the biggest landowner in the United States. And it will be, um, it, it won't for a second click to them that uh, perhaps the way to mitigate this issue would be government regulation that stops people from owning that many that many properties. But it's almost too late because the damage is done. You can't put the genie back in the bottle now, right? Well, because you could they- force people to sell or you could... Uh, uh, put a, a large tax Which on is, they're extra starting houses. To do that. Yeah, they are, but it's but they fucked up with the capital gain, not the capital gains, with the yeah, the capital gains thing, right? The net gearing, ne- ne- sorry, net your negative gearing, negative gearing, right? Yeah. So they encourage people to buy more properties. Now they're saying, oh, hang on, that was a bad idea. We got a pro- well, it's property. just one demographic that really bought that those properties, right? But it was a timing thing, I think, you, and like, a timing thing, yeah. yeah. So now that's why that all the hate goes towards the boomers because. They were afforded the opportunity post-war to potentially buy a house for $100,000 that's now worth $3 million. Yeah. They got it wrong or they – I don't know. They just didn't forecast then with that with that negative gearing thing that there's going to be almost 30 million people in Australia by 2020. They just were worried about what was going to happen in that decade. Yeah. And now we are where we are. And I don't know how you fix it. Yeah, and I suppose uh... – because putting interest rates up just fucking crunches these people to have to sell, force their hand, go back in the rental market. The rental market becomes fucking, yeah, it's... Uh... Yeah, I mean, personally, for me, I think that the answer is limiting the amount of homes or the amount of properties that a person can own. Yep. Um, and I, you know, I'm not... I, I, I just don't think that there's any justification for someone to own more than five properties. Like, if you're a millionaire and you're really successful... Get your beachside property, sure, have a bush property, have an apartment, sure. But when you get to the point where you have more than that mm. and you're purely having it for profiteering. And greed. And greed. And dick swinging. And dick swinging <laughs> or whatever, you yeah. know, then then the only outcome is that working people that just want somewhere to live mm. are now pr- priced out of the market because they want to profit more. The problem is that those people then, give the properties to their kids that then have this entitled sense mm-hmm. of we've got money and why should we have to do this? And it becomes uh, just like the perpetual cycle of people that might be trapped in the rental system. These people are trapped in this elitism system. Yeah. And I think, yeah, to take us back to like the freedom protesters, I think this is what the freedom protesters that were on the political right don't understand about the political left, which is where I think they could find common ground really easily mm-hmm. is that the political left has this, this whole ideology around property ownership that uh, wants redistribution, that basically wants working people um, to have more access to the housing market that they're priced out of. And these people on the political right that that would agree with that, but they can't get past the identity of leftists. They can't get past the, the fact that they do not want to be a purple-haired uh, university student leftist Mm. they can't get past that that they'll completely disregard that argument even though i know speaking to these um you know uh people in the freedom movement that they would 100 percent agree with a lot of the arguments that are made on the left Mm. um especially around housing uh but it's an identity thing they just can't get past the identity which is (laughs) they can't see past the labels yeah they can't they can't see past the labels and yeah and I understand, you know, and the left does the same thing. They, they, mm. you know, they'll just see everyone on the right as a frothing at the mouth racist. Um, and so. But like anything balanced in that, like putting the labels on stuff, like surely there's some sort of middle ground where stuff makes sense. You yeah. Think, but that's <laughs> fucking politics. Yeah. And then the middle, yeah, like the middle ground, well, the middle ground is kind of gotten us to where we are now. <laughs> I, don't know where, I, don't, I don't know what to say about the middle ground. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm on the political fringe, you know. That's what, well, that's I, it. Yeah. That's what I'm on. But I, I think it's really important and like a, a dude like Purple Ping, is, as much as his content is really funny, it's also really good to point out these capitalist people that are just profiteering, like you said, mm-hmm. off struggling working class people. 
like even last night on last like a locals page, my partner's like, oh my god, look at this ad, and they were just advertising a, a garage. I think it was three hundred bucks a week for a garage. They said it's got an ensuite and it's got a kitchenette, but it didn't have a sink. But you can wash your dishes in the bathroom ensuite, and it was three hundred bucks a week. And she's like, "This is where we're sort of at." And like, it was a bit of a purple pingers moment because he obviously finds places that are out of control. But that's where we're at, man. People are paying three hundred dollars a week, and this is only going to get worse. It's insane. Yeah. It's insane. I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know how much you're paying in rent, but my rent is killing me. And it only just seems that it, it's, it's, it's not even that rent is going up. It's the fear of rent going up that has these follow on uh, things. Like for instance, you know, in my house we have like all these maintenance issues that need to be addressed because there's growing mold and there's this, that, like all these different issues. We're too scared to go to our landlord about it because the landlord would feel obliged to fix it. And then we have a rent increase next, I've next heard, year. Yeah, you I've know? heard that happen to multiple people. Yeah. It's so and common. They it's are so common. too scared to, be on the radar because they feel like yeah. if they just tow the company line and we just keep our heads down, down and then they're not going to say, and by the way, it's an extra 40 bucks a week. You know? yeah. 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 It's a shit place to be in, but it's a reality is where we're at. I know. It's a nightmare. Um, back to your creative pursuits, man. What mm-hmm. else is coming up um, for what's doing media in 2024? Yeah, a few, I'm working on a few different docos. Um, Full length or short form? Short, or? probably short form. Um, would love to do like a feature long one, but uh, yeah, I just need to find the right topic. But um, yeah, I'm working currently on uh, one about Sharpies mm-hmm. uh, from yeah, the man. southeast in Melbourne. I've been trying to get someone from that subculture on and uh, it's a fascinating... Before my time. Yeah, my yeah. Dad definitely was, before my time. Yeah, <laughs> I think it was sort of late. 70s, early 80s, it kind of, but yeah. Yeah. Fuck, it's an interesting time, man. It is super interesting for, like, if your viewers don't know what Sharpies were, they were... Um, they weren't it, texters, they weren't marketers. No, it was a, it was a subculture um, of, you know, again, working class, young people, um, mostly teenagers, really, um, from uh, all over Melbourne. They wore really sharp clothes, hence the name. Um, so like, I suppose that know, would be almost sharp. Yeah. They, they, they were, um, cardigans and, um, you know, boots and nice tight pants and all of their, um, clothes were manufactured by Italian migrants that came over, um, in that period of time. So it was back in the day when everything was manufactured in Melbourne. Um, and, uh, it was, I suppose the, the culture can be summed up in like three main points, which was, uh, music um, fashion and violence, and uh, all three were crucial. Yeah. <laughs> um, they, yeah, really loved the way that they dressed. Uh, they the music was really important to them, and they loved punching on. Gotcha. Um, and it was uh, look. I'm gonna just interject and say it was probably, from my knowledge, the first sort of represent your area and gang kind of culture that we had in Melbourne. Exactly. Yeah, it was. Really, it was the initial. It was the first postcode wars. Yeah. Um, and you know, people talk a lot about how postcode wars is a, is a new phenomenon. It's not. No. Um, and these sharpies were very much representing uh, their area and the ones. So I I filmed a um, short piece for uh, to accompany a, a short film that my friend is producing um, on the sharpies uh, culture. And when I was talking to them they would tell me crazy stories about, um, yeah, just getting home on the train from wherever they'd been at a dance or whatever and literally having to fight their way through suburbs. Yeah. Um, And it was really interesting to me because I really wanted to talk to them about how they perceive um, youth crime today in relation to their experience. And, you know, there's constantly a moral panic around youth crime, um, Every five years, youth crime is suddenly so much worse than it's ever been. Um, and I talked to them about it because in their era, um, they were the moral panic. Sharpies causing mayhem, violence on our streets, youth gangs, blah, blah, uh, And I was talking to them about it, whether or not they thought it got wor- has, is, has gotten worse. And they were adamant that it was 100% worse now than it was then. 
and they were like, you know, the kids these days, they're going around with machetes and they're going around with knives and we didn't do that. We only fought with our fists. And, and I, I get that. I, I understand that. But never have I heard a story in Melbourne of someone getting on a train and having to fight their way back through the suburbs. There are There is violence on the trains for yeah, sure. Yeah. I've experienced it. But fighting your way back through the suburbs like it's a, you know, scene from The Warriors yeah. is... Insane. Well, right? that, that's the whole thing that I find so um, uh, intriguing about the whole sharp culture is that even within the scene of being a sharp or being a sharpie, there's factions of different areas. And then I've heard stories from my dad's era people where they would be like, well, the St Kilda sharps were there and the Blackburn sharps turned up and they don't get along. So then these sharps punched on with those sharps and then these other sharps from the Sandringham, you know what I mean? It's like... Well, you know what's crazy? The reunion that I went to, there were sharpie groups that didn't go to that reunion because there's still bad blood and they wouldn't... They and wouldn't like come. And this 50 is 50 years later. Exactly. These, these were... Older men and women, and there was a lot of women there as well. It's it like, are they, they still rocking the haircuts? Uh, it was it was probably about fifty fifty uh, people that were like dressed in the gear and people that had kind of let let it let it go. Um, but yeah, they were they were really interesting people. They were. Um, I'd love you to point me in the right direction because I'm. I, I could definitely point yeah, you in the I'd right direction. To, man. Yeah. Um, but some of the stories they told me were just. Yeah, really hectic things for a teenager to go through. Yep. You know, and they were really teenagers. But yeah, for sure. The whole thing that I find extremely interesting is that it was, they in, they developed a culture. Completely which, organically and without any influence from the rest of the world. Correct. And yeah. that's the thing now where, you know, I'm wearing a hat that could be argued is American influence and whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But what they were doing was... Australiana at its core without anyone telling them to do that. They mm -hmm. just developed it. It didn't exist. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It is really cool. And they told me that it was really born out of boredom. And I suppose that's why a lot of young people today don't really experience boredom the same way that older generations do because, you know, how can you be TikTok? Uh, how can you be bored when you have TikTok in your hand? Mm. Um, but yeah, they... They really did, as teenagers, develop an, an entire subculture organically. And I feel like for a lot of them, they didn't actually realise the extent of the culture that they'd created until, you know... Later. Later. Because when you're a teenager, you just kind of... You don't realise that you're creating culture. You're just doing what your friends are doing, yeah. dressing how your friends are dressing um, and listening to what your friends are listening to. For sure. And then that you've got to think that that is such a pure way to develop a culture because you're not looking at influences from overseas yeah. because you don't have the internet there and you're not seeing what you're just seeing what you're seeing in the flesh. And that's how it, it evolves. Stuff like that couldn't happen that organically anymore. No. I, yeah. Perhaps not. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm always on the lookout for new youth subcultures. I love them. You know, I was part of a few when I was younger. Yeah, and... tell, tell, break, break them down, break them down. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I was, I was uh, part of, um, uh, how could you describe it? Like the football ultra, um, yep. football hooliganism world from the age of like 12 to 18. Yep. So I used is this to, in the SNL days? Or no, it? this is, so this was Melbourne Victory, the North Terrace. Yep. Um, and it, yeah, it ruled my life as a teenager. I loved it. I was obsessed with it. Um, I was one of the youngest uh, kids. It was mostly adults. How how old are you? I'm um, 27 okay. now. Yep. So, because um, it was super racial when I grew up in South Melbourne, Port Melbourne, South Melbourne, Hallis would punch on with yeah the Melbourne Knights, which Heidelberg was another Greek affiliated team. Like, and then they, I guess you're just a bit a bit younger. Yeah, so I, I suppose Melbourne Victory at, in those early years, it was actually this really beautiful moment where all of these ethnicities came together. And that was the goal. That's that was what the they goal. And they, and, and they they actually achieved it because, you know, a lot of the people that, um, you know, were in the crews that we ran with were, you know, it, you'd have Croatians, Serbians and Bosnians all together. Um, you have Greeks and Italians together. Uh, you'd have um, South Americans there, whole, whole different, you know, groups of people. And then you have white people who didn't necessarily have a team before, yeah. like, you know, Aussies. 
uh, that didn't have a team beforehand. And all just hated um, Sydney together. <laughs> exactly. It was, yeah, it was great. So I went to some of those early games at, at Amy it was back, or maybe it was even Colonial Stadium back then. Yeah. And yeah, Sydney and Melbourne and they would lock the doors and you, Sydney would have to exit first. And we'd yeah. never seen anything like that yeah. in Australia on that sort of scale. Yeah, and I guess, you know, that that culture as well is very much informed by fashion, um, choreography, which is, you know, like the displaying of of um, uh, flags and, and uh, uh, banners and stuff like that and violence. Hmm. And so I can really understand, like especially when I'm working with young people, I can really understand young men, young boys, I can really understand why those three motivators are so important for young boys. Hmm. Um, it's a tribal thing. Yeah, it's a tribal thing. It's about um, having boys that will back you up and there's an aspect of, toxic masculinity in it as well which i think is is the the sadder part about it because yeah i feel like i don't know uh, a lot of young men feel that they need to have peer respect mm. in in a in in a way that's uh that they are seen as feared and i think that's really deeply rooted in a lot of the problems that men have is that we want to be like individually we want or feel the need to be feared and once you turn 18 and get into the real world and become an adult the the concept of being feared is not something that like I would ever want like I don't want people to fear no. me you know I I I'm I'm it's, 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 that's an angsty teenage thing you know what a, I mean it's an angsty teenage thing for sure um and in many respects it informs the best culture that we have like you look at drill music that's so informed by intense hyper masculinity and the desire to be feared and it makes amazing music in my opinion mm. right so i'm not discounting the no. cultural impact of it and the cultural importance of it but it is obviously you know a lot of youth crime and a lot and of youth violence is rooted in that but then it, and this is something that I've spoken to a few people about, but at what point does it become art imitating life art, life imitating art? These kids emulate what they see in the film clips and does that make men, does that have a negative spin on what they do? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it is an unanswerable question and I know a lot of people feel the need to answer it about what, you know, chicken or the egg with drill music um, and I'm not here to answer it. I enjoy the music and, um, yeah, I'm not here to judge young people about the way that they, um, you know, produce art. Mm. Do you still get down to the football? I don't. I got banned for a long time, uh, for about five years, and then I, yeah, just kind of fell out of interest with it. I would actually love to go back, but... There's a whole new world there. There's new crews. There are still, you know, the established uh, crews and, and people that have been going for now 20 years. It's going to be 20 years next year. Um, is the racial element out of it? Is it still like the Greeks still do their thing in the... There's no racial element in the um, in the top league of football, like the A-League. No, no, but I mean in the, in the communities because I know that there are different like factions within the the supporter groups? Yeah, they're not – all of them are, are mixed okay. ethnicity. Yep. The yeah. only the only difference is that uh, – and I'm not sure if this is still the case, but um, in the early days of Melbourne Victory, there was the South End, which was more of a British style of support. So it was like uh, random chanting, drinking, like chanting, no leader. It was just kind of like chanting when you felt like it, which is the British style. Yeah. And then on the other side, the North Terrace, which is where, where I was, was a European ultra style of um, support where it's 90 minutes, you have a capo uh, who leads like a leader um, and it's, yeah, a big focus on choreography, flares um, and more of like the artistic element um, of support, yeah. It's interesting to, to hear that. It's artistic, but yeah, I've been all over. It's deeply games. artistic. <laughs> it, it's crazy. I know, I know, I know. You, I, I totally understand the um, perspective from a third person now that I'm out of that world and, you know, you only see what you see in the media, but when you're involved in that world, it is deeply artistic because, you know, we would often take time of, out of our lives before games and they still do, you know, the people that are still involved to paint the most extravagant banners all with our own money mm. um, for a team that 
you know, the higher ups of the team didn't even like like the pe- I know, the, that's the, the, thing, the yeah. people that are running Melbourne Victory. They we're didn't like even like us. Yeah. They were banning us. You know, they banned so many of us. Um, you know, I was one of many, like maybe a hundred people that got banned, you know? Mm. And so they didn't even like us. We would put our heart and soul into it. Mm. Um, and, you know, full credit to the, um, the people that have kept the North Terrace going. And now it's, you know, still an absolutely, you know, thriving culture. Mm. Uh, and, you know, they still do fuck up sometimes and do stupid shit. <laughs> they <Yeah. laughs> they were the poster boys for fucking up a couple of seasons yeah, last year, yeah, I yeah, think. Yeah, but yeah, uh, totally. anyway, we'll leave it there. Um, man, we've had a good chat. I think we've have we covered most things. Yeah, I reckon. I appreciate you coming in. It's been really interesting and uh, hopefully they don't uh, flag any of us with talking about the, the, yeah, some COVID of the things stuff, that we've been talking about and other things. But look... You can beep it out. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see how we go. We'll put it up there and hopefully... Man, I'd love you to come back again soon as well, talk about other stuff you've been doing and mm-hmm. just talk about some interesting uh, takes on where Melbourne culture's at and, you know, the stuff that we could fix. Yeah, I would, I would love to fix things. <laughs> <laughs> try my best. I think a lot of people would. We want to try and put yeah. a positive spin on it and try and think, like... It's one thing to call out all the issues, but if you don't, if people aren't trying to do anything about them, what's the fucking point? Yeah, I mean, I, I I feel like I'm in a good place to shed light on all the heroes that are fixing things because they're all all out there. They're doing crazy stuff. They're doing amazing stuff, um, and they're doing a heck of a lot more than I than I am. So I'm like yeah. here to, here to spruik them for sure. Yeah. All right, I appreciate you coming in, man. Um, let's wrap it up. Cheers, bro. Thank you. Three thousand.